Uh, my name is Khalil. All right, so we are going to move forward with uh, the talk from Dr. Lee. So Dr. Lee is an associate professor of orthopedic surgery at the Boston University School of Medicine and is team physician for the Boston University Athletic Department, Go Terriers. Uh, he has a strong clinical interest in both sports medicine and shoulder surgery and has published over 100 scientific articles and given over 250 presentations at orthopedic meetings. He is an editorial board member of several peer-reviewed orthopedic journals, and we are very excited to have him speak tonight on the management of acromioclavicular joint separation. So thank you, Dr. Lee, again for being here, and feel free to share your screen and get started. Okay, perfect. Let's see if I can do this. So let me start sharing. All right. All right, can you guys hear me? Is this okay? Yes. All right, so tonight I'm just gonna give you guys a, is this maybe 25 minutes or, you know, upward about maybe 30, hopefully that's not too bad uh, for you guys for too long. But uh, it's a big topic, management AC separation injuries. And uh, thanks for the introduction. Thanks for having me, Vic. So I'll start with a case presentation. This is a typical patient that I see in my clinic, 26 year old guy, uh, complaining shoulder pain. Usually when they come in, they complain a pain on the top of the shoulder, worsening, you know, wearing a backpack or head activity, something that they wear and lower the shoulder after AC separation bothers them. They get some decreased range of motion, some weakness with lifting. Uh, there's always a deformity or a promise that bothers them. Uh, on the top of the shoulder and there's recurrent, this guy had recurrent trapezius spasms and some people do and some people don't. And you look at the injury history, these guys always hit, fall directly on the shoulder. That's how they get it. You land directly on the top of the shoulder, it separates the AC uh, joint depending on how hard you fall. This happened about three years ago and uh, he had prior physical therapy treatment. He was still having some issues when he first saw me. You look at uh, his physical examination, he's got a deformity, promised AC joint. This is his shoulder uh, in the OR. Pain and deep palpation. He had normal range of motion, full cuff strength. However, uh, he did have some pain weakness overhead activities. That's what really bothers him, is when he tries to reach up higher and, you know, overhead activities and he can't do it. And also where, when he wears his backpack, it really bothers him at the joint. It feels the joint is subluxate down and it, there's some pain associated with him. And uh, he is neuro neurovascular intact. So here's his radiograph evaluation. If you look at the difference in the AC joint, we, we always measure at the coracoclavicular interval, which I'll show you guys uh, what that means and, and uh, comparison of the injured side with the contralateral side, which is you know, assumed is normal. And this guy had a nine millimeters versus 23 millimeters. So it's a hundred percent greater displacement. So what is this in terms of classification AC joints? So that's a type five chronic AC separation. And should we do surgery for these guys or should we do non-operative management? And this is gonna be pretty much the bulk of my talk looking at you know, these injury patterns and which one should you do surgery, which one uh, you could do treat non-op. And I would argue majority of them you can non-op and they, they would do fine. And then I'm gonna go over some of the different types of surgery that you have from historical uh, for the orthopedics and also what I do. Uh, I, I do either an arthroscopic approach and an open approach. I do both depending on the type of patient and what their you know, goals are. So look at the anatomy, the AC joint, this small joint that's got a cartilage. It's sloped inferiorly and medially. And we look at the radiographs on the joint here, there's a slant to it. So that's why you can't really inject this joint in the office. When you put a needle in blindly, it's very difficult to match the slant and get this uh, needle into the joint for somebody who has AC arthritis, especially with a neuroing joint. Uh, so I always send these, if they have an AC joint pain, I always send them to Alshon Gata injection. And then 50% of the AC joint, there's an override of the clavicle. So that means the clavicle kind of overrides the chromium in 50% of the patients. When we look at the anatomy, the AC ligament with AC capsule is here. And that's mostly responsible for anterior posterior translation and some superior translation. About 25% posterior and about 56% uh, superior. And that capsule is important. You don't want to disrupt the joint surgery because if you do, you can cause AC uh, instability. We look at the CC ligaments, which is a coronoid and the trapezoid. The coronoid is more up and down. It's more medially attached to the clavicle and the trapezoid is more lateral and anterior to the clavicle. And majority of the vertical stability 
of the AC joint comes from the CC ligaments and mostly from the coronoid because the coronoid is more straight up and down than the trapezoid. And then lastly, you have the CA ligament, which is coracoacromial ligament that attached from the coracoid to the chromium. And that doesn't really do much for the stability, but it's a ligament that's, that's also you should think about when you uh, evaluate these patients. Looking at other things, dynamic stabilizers. So it's really important looking at deltoid, trapezoid, and serious anterior because all these muscles function to stabilize the AC joint. If you have an AC joint separation, what happens is patient can get kinematic issues of the scapula because the clavicle holds the scapula and the axial skeleton to, you know, to the axial skeleton. When you have a disruption of the clavicle, the AC joint, the, the scapula can inferior subluxate and they can have issues with you know, kinematics and that can cause the patient some problems as well. So look at the CC ligament anatomy. Here's the posterior view, it's a little confusing, but that's a coronoid ligament. It fans out significantly and is up and down. And this is the trapezoid ligament here. That's the clavicle right here and the chromium is right there. This is the CA ligament coming in. The trapezoid ligament is much thinner and it attaches from the coracoid base to the, to the lateral aspect of, uh, of the uh, clavicle, and here is the coronoid, which is a fan out uh, structure. Why is this important? Because when we do surgery, if these patients do get disruption, you're coming up and doing surgery for them, it's important because you want to replicate their anatomy. And how you drill the tunnel, where you drill the tunnel, is very important that you make sure you drill the tunnel where the anatomy is. So the coronoid ligament is here, it's a little bit posterior, and it's about 4.5 centimeters from the lateral edge of the clavicle over. And then the trapezoid ligament is a little bit anterior and it's about 2.5 centimeter from the lateral edge over. So that's where I put my hose in when I do a, a CC ligament construction, which I'll show you guys how, how it's done later on in the slides. And look at the classification. So everything orthopedics has a classification, as you guys know. And this one came out in 1967. Albin and Tozzi did types one to three. And then it's later modified by Rockwood to types four, five, and six in the shoulder in 1990. And this is the diagram a lot of people, you know, reference for AC separation. So I'm going to go through every single one of them. But the ones that you want to consider for surgery or, you know, at least have a discussion with a patient, uh, you know, that's type 5 is typically the ones that uh, may or may not need surgery. The type 3s are very controversial. Uh, I think a lot of these do not need surgery. They can be treated non-op. And if they have problems down the road, you can always come back and do surgery for them. Type 1 and 2 is non-op. And then 4, you probably... <clears throat> need surgery for because of clavicle is diso dislocated posteriorly and six you never see it's reported in the literature maybe one time uh, i've never seen this type of pattern where the clavicle is inferiorly dislocated underneath the coracoid so looking at type one's ac spring what you happens you spring this ligament here cc ac and cc ligament both intact you get a normal radiograph these patients not out 100 percent type two and you get ac rupture the ligament, the CC ligament is intact, and the distance is less than 25% displacement compared to contralateral side. This is also not up for, you know, for these patients when they come to see you in the clinic. Type 3, AC and CC ligament is ruptured. It does not disrupt the trapezius and deltoid fascia, and the displacement about 25 to 100% is superior displacement in the clavicle. And that's considered type 3. And it's a little controversial, but you know, in my practice, these are uh, typically non-op for me until they have problems after three, six months of physical therapy, then I can talk to them about surgery. So type four is posterior displacement of the clavicle through the trapezius, and this is when the clavicle goes back. Uh, here's, the, here's the coracoid, and this is when it goes back posteriorly. And it's really important to get an actual view when this happens to, you know, you want to make sure you rule out uh, these clavicles at this code posteriorly, because these are, this is an indication of surgery in my mind. So type five, uh, you have extreme elevation of the clavicle is more than 100% displaced. So typically, if you're doing 100 to 300% uh, displacement, you'll get disruption in the trapezius fascia and also the deltoid superiorly. And these are the patients that you, you probably want to consider surgery, although I can argue that, um, that I do see quite a bit of patients do very well with non-op on these. So I, I can go over my you know, management algorithm for you guys uh, later on the slide and you know, tell you who I think a good surgical candidate who you can wait. So type six is inferior dislocation of the clavicle and these, uh, it really never happens. It's extremely rare to see this. I've never seen it. It's reported maybe one time in the literature as a case report. So we talked about the Mackens injury. They said patients that come in, they fall directly on the shoulder girdle and then this have a major force 
you disrupt the AC ligament, the joint capsule, CC ligament, and the trapezial fascia. And this is going progressing from type one all the way to type five, you know, separation depending on the severity of the force. And then looking at epidemiology, so how much does this occur to different types? This is out of Italy. Uh, it's about 10% of all shoulder injury AC joint dislocations. Two thirds of them, as you can imagine, is young patients, 90% males. It's really the most common shoulder injury in football players and the third most common in Division I hockey. Type five occurs about 20%, so one out of five is type five. And then type three in the study is about one out, one out of three, which is about 33 to 40%. And majority of these are, are type one, two, and three, and there's very little six. I think there's one six, which is here uh, reported, but the rest of them, you don't see any six or fours. They're very rare. So when we look at diagnosis, radiographic is important. Uh, when you look at the AP of the shoulder, the coracoid distance from here to the undersurface of the clavicle is typically about one to 1 1.3 centimeters. And then you want to get an actual view, which is looking at the shoulder with the humeral head this way, and you sh it's a shoot through view, which um, you, can, you want to make sure you, you don't miss the type four AC separation with the clavicle displaced posteriorly uh, here. What I typically get, which is uh, what everybody gets in the literature, is, uh, is a called a Zinca view. It's a bilateral AC joint view. It's a 15 degree cephalic view. So you tilt the radiographs up 15 degrees to the shoulder, one third to one half exposure, so you don't see as much of the you know, soft tissue in the bone. And then you can see in this view that you compare the normal side, CC distance to the contralateral side as a measurement and the displacement uh, percentage. That's how you grade these uh, AC separations. So here's a bilateral zinc view. Here's a normal side, which is about one centimeter. Here's that normal. This is probably 2.2, 2.3 centimeters. That, that would consider, to me, a type 5 EC separation. You can also get what we call the Basmania view, which is uh, Alexander Basmania came out with cross arm adduction radiographs. When you cross arm and, you, and then act up the shoulder, so which is basically turning your shoulder this way, and you shoot an AP x ray, what you get is you get, you get that. A, the clavicle displays even more when you cross, you know, do a cross bar adduction. So you can see the, the deformity a lot more when you, uh, cut, you know, cross arm your shoulder, which is one of the views that they use. I typically don't use this view because a lot of patients can't tolerate it. It's uh, a little bit too painful for them to do this. So one thing you want to think about in patient that had type five injuries and you're thinking about surgery, I always get an MRI, and the reason I get an MRI is because. At least a couple of papers that show 18 to 30 percent of social injuries with these patients that had type 5 AC separation. So you don't want to have any surprises going into surgery. I typically always scope them just to make sure, you know, address the intraticular with a scope before I go and do my reconstruction uh, last. So here's an image of the MRI, and then this is the coracoid uh, CC ligament here. This is the sagittal oblique imaging. And here's a coronal imaging. You can see the CC ligament as a cor coracoid and as a clavicle. This is the disruption of the CC ligament is right here. So management, you know, go over this type one, type two, non-surgical. You always want to just make sure they start PT. Uh, sling just for comfort, maybe one week or two. Ice therapy, uh, pain-free range of motion. They can start using it right away. Usually it takes about a couple weeks and the pain goes away and they can, you know, activities tolerate four to six weeks. Uh, based on symptoms. Types, uh, <clears throat> interesting enough, this paper came out as a little bit older paper in uh, I believe 2009 or so. And they found that if you had type one, type two injury, the AC joint, uh, and the patient followed more than 10 years, 50% has some impingement or you know, impairment in the shoulder function and their scores are a little bit lower than the contralateral side. I think this is because they, they may go on to develop AC joint arthritis down the road. So I tell the patient that, hey, you know, most of these patients that come in with type one, type two injuries, uh, they're going to do fine with a PT, but you know, I tell them down the road, you probably should follow it up every five, 10 years to make sure it's good because when you have a disruption in the capsule, that can lead to post-traumatic arthritis in the joint that may, may or may not develop pain you know, down the road. If it does develop pain, you can always deal with it down at that time. But there's something important to tell the patient when you see them. So type three is very controversial if you should do these uh, surgery for them acutely. Uh, a lot of the studies that, that were perspective randomized when I wrote a paper for JVS 10 years ago uh, in 2011, these studies were over 20 years, 20 years old and they had surgical fixation for these that were uh, not used currently, which is basically a Bosworth screw, the screw that drills down from the clavicle that goes down to the coracoid and holds it in place or two K wires 
you know, to, uh, to uh, stabilize the joint. That's not something we do in 2020. And this is a paper that we, I wrote when I was, a, when I was a, uh HSS. It's published in 2014, but majority of data, you know, for JBJS, it takes about two years to get to print and to publish. So a lot of data that we, we wrote, I wrote this in 2012. And we'll, you can see the dates on these studies where, you know, this is randomized perspective study looking at acute surgery versus non off or type three injuries. And they all show that, you know, mo for the most part, non-surgery versus surgery did the same for type three. So they're advocating for non-surgical intervention. And this is all, you know, older literature, but there's some recent literature that shows that, you know, patients that have overhead activities or heavy labor, that if you do surgery early, they might do a little better than non op uh, for them. So I think this is the best uh, study current published out in 2019. This is a mostly, this is the perspective randomized study looking at non-op versus op treatment of acute AC joint separation. Majority of these patients are type three, there are some type five. Uh, 83 patients uh, randomized to 40 and 43 groups. I think 43 was a non-op and 40 was an op repair. And they use hook plate, which I'll show you what it is. It's basically putting a plate on the clavicle going underneath the chromium to stabilize the AC joint. And what they found is that uh, the non-op group actually had better early functional outcome scores, but both groups have significant level of improvement. They're very equal in the DASH score and the constant score at two years. So the authors conclude that there's really no clear evidence for operative treatment or at least acute operative treatment of type three AC separations uh, in these patients or even type five. So recommendation, I think for type three, uh, really there's not much functional difference between two groups in the literature. There's a little bit higher overall complication rate, longer time before we turn to do surgery on them. Uh, some of the patient that may benefit is overhead uh, athletes or maybe heavy laborers, but you're gonna have to have a conversation with the patient uh, whether you uh, the risk benefits indication of surgery versus non-op and waiting. So for me, in my practice, for these patient type three, they always get initial non-op uh, for three to four months. You can consider surgical management the patient that has significant deformity, persistent pain, failed concern management, or they have higher functional demand work or sports. That's the type of patient I would talk to them, you know, for somebody who would do surgery sooner than later. And you can see this is a, this is a AC separation type three there. So what about type five uh, surgery? Should we do surgery on all type five that comes in? You know, I wrote this back in 2012, and it was published in 2014. And in, in my uh, highlight point, we, we recommended, you know, type five AC separation. We thought that was a surgical indication for all the patients. And I've been in practice seven years. I can tell you that with seven years of experience, that was probably not the correct recommendation. I think a lot of these patients, or most of these patients would do fine based on what their pre-op activity level is. If they're high demand, they probably need surgery, but if they're low demand, um, don't use their upper extremity much overhead activities, a little bit older, a lot of these patients will do very well with non-op treatment, even type five AC separations. So in terms of management, type five and type three injuries, uh, you know, every patient that comes to the clinic, I really, I, there's a three question you gotta ask yourself. Would this patient benefit from a surgery, yes or no? Is non-op is, is non better? For them, or is the risk of taking a surgery going to be better for their outcome? The same question I ask is, what if you delay surgery? Um, say you do acute, you know, management, just non-op, you delay surgery for six months, is that going to compromise the outcome? That's the second question, you know, I typically ask myself. And if you are going to go do surgery on these patients, are you going to do anatomic fixation or non-anatomic? Are you going to repair it? Um, so for me, in orthopedics, anything you do, typically anatomic is better than non-anatomic. So for me, I typically favor the non-op delay, delay in surgery because I don't think there's anything that you're risking by waiting. And then I do an anatomical reconstruction. I, t I don't like to do a repair, which I'll show you what that means um, in the further slides. This is, this is, this is the kind of the, what I prefer in my practice. So look at the operator versus non-operator, how do you decide? It's individual discussion, taking account what they do, what they wanna do, what their expectations are, you know, whether they have pain, look at their scapula, whether they have a droopiness of the scapula or there's a dyskinesis of the scapula, all those things are important criteria uh, to talk to them about whether these people benefit or surgery versus not. And that's, you know, a lot of this is probably beyond the scope of this talk. 14 study were very comparative outcomes between opera and non operally mostly type three and type five. And they found that, you know, with 600 patients follow 67 months, really the clinical outcome was good to excellent in both groups. You know, non op is 86%, op is 88%. Return to previous level of work, a little bit quicker for the non-op because you don't go through the rehab aspect of it.
So this is a nice paper that came out, uh, the Yellow Journal, looking at non-operative outcomes of type 5, and they had 22 patients that were 42 years or so, greater than six months in non-op management, distance displacement at 200%, pretty significant type 5 injuries. As you can see, mostly male, one female. What they found is interesting, quarter of the patient had normal functional scores, so they didn't have great functional scores, but at the final follow-up, 77% of working. Uh, they weren't really, you know, they weren't really at home, but they're working. And in fact, all many labor were able to return to work without any issues. So that just shows you a lot of people can do a lot of things with lower degrees of scaption. So you don't need to go all the way up to your shoulder, all the way up to, you know, 90, 120, 130 degrees to work. And a lot of these people can, can do pretty well with these injuries and work in the lower degrees of flexion and tolerate it. So this is a patient that came to me. I don't know if you guys can see the video, but here's a guy that has sent to me. Is he doing separation from all? So his PCP sent this guy to me thinking they need surgery. And he's been, he's been three years like this. He has no functional limitations. He's got type A AC separation, no strength deficit, no pain. You know, obviously for this patient, you just come to non op, you don't do anything with him. But you can see this is, if you look at his AC joint, it's right there, it's pretty displaced. Okay, and then I'm gonna do a resistance, so hold it okay. right here, right there, okay, and then lift up against it. Okay, come back down, okay, one more time, lift up. You can see it's pretty displaced. Yeah. And none of that bothers you. No, you're able to do what you want to do, all your activities. <coughs> okay, and drum as well. Okay, no pain, no, no pain, issues, nothing like that. So you're pretty happy with the way it's gone. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. And go ahead. So, if you do go down the operative management, the patient, you know, don't do as well with the PT and let them wait three, four months and they're still having issues, weakness, overactivity, bosom pain, then there's many different techniques of fixing AC joint, CC, you know, CC joint. There's probably 30 to 40 different techniques you can do across the literature in the last 30, 40 years. You can fix across the AC joint, you can fix it across the CC joint. Uh, you can done it. The idea is really stabilization of the clavicle relationship to the AC uh, joint. That's the idea. And then we look at early versus delayed surgery. Uh, interesting enough, they said in this article, there may be a little benefit early repair compared to late for type, you know, type 5 AC separation, but the level of evidence is really lacking. And in fact, the only outcome that's favored is uh, with the delays. If you look here is that if you do early, they do better in terms of functional outcome scores. Um, compared to delay, but everything else is pretty much the same. Return to sports, early versus delay, a little bit better, but you know, 80% is not bad. And then in terms of return to work, 97% versus you know, 94% for the return to work. So I think, I think in, in a day, I think uh, a lot of these patients, if, if you delay surgery, it's not, it's not a bad idea, and then give them a chance to heal. A lot of them will do pretty well. Some of the options, uh, in repair versus reconstruction, acute versus chronic, open versus arthroscopic, uh, anatomic versus non-anatomic, and the different graphs you can use is allograph versus autograph, which is autograph is something taking off from your own knee. So for this, you can do a hamstring reconstruction. So you can take the patient's hamstring and reconstruct the CC ligament with it. So the options, some of the traditional option, uh, AC ligament repair, CC ligament repair with a Bosworth screw or a dog button. And uh, you can do a dynamic muscle transfer, CC ligament transfer. These are a little bit older uh, in the literature. And if you look at the current days, a lot of us will be, for these chronic type five AC separations, the CC ligament reconstruction. I typically use an allograft so I don't have to harvest the patient's knee. And you can do this open or arthroscopic. And I'll show you a couple of the techniques uh, in the videos of my patients. So this is the AC ligament uh, hook plate and this is the plate you put on the cloud coat you put a hook into the AC joint and the hook goes underneath the chromium which I think the problem with these plates is that this will typically bother the patient is at the AC joint because you can imagine this thing is holding down entirely by that hook there's a lot of force here you can you know fracture or have issues in the AC joint uh, dynamic muscle transfer has also been described. You can take a biceps tendon and go up to the AC joint and hold it down. It's not, this is maybe a case series, but it's definitely not done in modern day orthopedics. This is the traditional way that we repair it, uh, which is a coracle leg, uh, coracle chromial ligament transfer. It's called a Weaver Dunn. 
what you do is you take the CA ligament, you take it off at the very top of the chromium, and then you suture that to the distal and the cloud could hold it down. That's not something we do in 2020 as well. In the coracoid fixation, that's uh, also done in traditionally old day, you put a screw, so basically reduce the uh, clavicle down and then you take a screw and you screw the uh, top to the coracoid base and then that holds the, you know, hold the reduction. And you can imagine if something happens, you can break the coracoid base and that would be pretty catastrophic uh, issues. And then you can also tie different sutures across the base to hold it down. But I can tell you that's not uh, typically done uh, in modern day. So we look at CC reconstruction, open arthroscopic graft. This is what I do for these patients, especially if you do not up and you delay the surgery and they still have issues uh, because you can't really do a repair. The biology is not there anymore. I, I scope everybody because 20% instance of intra injuries, you address them first. Uh, you know, whether it's scope for a cuff, scope for a biceps or a labrum, you want to take care of that first and then you go to the, uh, the AC joint next. So open AC joint ligament reconstruction, this is a technique that I used that I described by Mazaka in 2006, is an open reconstruction with a uh, tendon graft. I use semi-tendinosis with a hamstring. And what you do is you wrap the graft around the base of the coracoid, you drill two holes, you anatomically match the coronal um, and the trapezoid ligament, and you tie a suture across the whole, hold this while this whole thing heals. And this is what the surgery looks like out of the, of the manuscript and the way you drill it is you measure 4.5 centimeter for the coronoid and then uh, just about 15 millimeters, 1.5 centimeter for the trapezoid and then you drill two holes, you pass the graft underneath and fix it with a screw. And you do a passer, which is a, you know, arthritis passer here and then tie the leg metal top. So this is the entire technique, uh, it's about five minutes. This is a, this is a, I videotaped this for, for one of the, <clears throat> Uh, journals, but you can see it's a saber incision. Uh, here is the clavicle. That's the AC joint. That's the coracoid base. You go down. This is the trapezius fascia here. You're coming down to the deltoid now, right? So I make a flap on the top of the deltoid, just in line in the distal third of the clavicle. And then once you make a flap, you release the deltoid, you tag it with sutures. This will help you expose the top of the coracoid uh, bay, the top of the coracoid so it can help you safely dissect out and be able to visualize either the, the medial and lateral side. So you can see these are number two sutures. I tag either side of them. And then I do a little tiny split in the middle between the two so that you can get better exposure down to the top of the coracoid because a lot of the stuff is really important is exposure is if you can't see it, you can't do the case. And, and I can tell you the brachial plexus is right here. It's about a centimeter away from working. If you cut the plexus, the patient will bleed to death within probably, you know, a minute or 30 seconds, and it'd be very hard to stop, you know, the bleeding. So here's a retractor on the video side. And then me splitting down a little bit over the coracoid. And then here's a retractor on the lateral side, and here's just coming on top of the coracoid base now. So you free all the soft tissue on either side, you take a little elevator, you free up the soft tissue underneath the coracoid. And this is the passer that that uh, shows you on the last slide. Once you take a passer out, it's a little suture goes in. And this is the suture for the graft that's coming in. So once you pass all the suture from the tail of the graft, this goes underneath the coracoid. And you just show the graft underneath. So now the graft is docked underneath the coracoid base. So now what you do is you go on top of the clavicle, you basically measure 4.5 centimeters for the coronoid, and then trapezoid is just about 1.5 centimeters from that. And then I put something underneath to protect the drill bit from going under because all the vessels are underneath. So this is the trapezoid, and that's the coronoid drill. The two K wires goes in, and then what we do is you do five millimeter uh, reamers that goes through, through the K-wire. So these goes down, you can see you wanna be very careful, you don't wanna plunge them uh, because of the, all the neurovascular bundles right underneath.
All right, so now you drill the two holes, you clear the soft tissue, and then you pass the suture across with another passer. And here's one limb. So the coracoid goes up, and then the second limb crisscross goes here on the side. Here's the first limb. And then the second limb is here. So this is the coronoid ligament that you were constructing, and this is the trapezoid ligament that you're constructing on the lateral side. So now after you get the two grafts on top, I tie the suture, which is a suture that reinforces repair on top and it reduce the joint. And then, and then I put two screws uh, into the joint here. These are interference screws that fix the graft down for you. Okay, you can see the screw going in. And then here's the second screw goes in right here. And then what we do is we tie the graft onto itself on top. We'll interrupt the suture so it kind of reinforces itself. Uh, just this uh, fail safe type of uh, fixation. So this is the final uh, reconstruction here. You can see a crisscross and then you just suture everything up together and close up the wound. So that's a final repair there. So that's open CC reconstruction. And the clinical outcome is good. This is Mazaka's technique, has 76 patients, and we found that uh, they all improved in ASDS, constant scores, and row score at final follow up, which is two year follow up for them. And really, he, he listed some of the key to success, which is similar to what my approach is. You want to individualize the treatment to the athletes and the patients. Uh, you want to look at horizontal stability, uh, which is the ATP stability. and um, he does a repair the AC joint as well as the CC ligament. Uh, and then technically you want to ream about five millimeter tunnel, uh, separated by at least 15 to 20 millimeters, because if you ream the tunnel too close, what happens is you can crisscross, you can break your tunnel, you can fracture uh, the clavicle. And then anatomic reconstruction is better than non-anatomic. Uh, it's biomechanically superior to the reaver done. I brace these patients for six weeks and typically six to nine months before they go back to sports. Another thing I uh, talk about, this is an arscopic CC ligament repair with a button. So you can, uh, in the patients that you want to do acutely, type five, type three, when the biology is still there, they come in with a three weeks of injury. You can do this arscopically, put a button underneath and on top, and then you can reduce the joint. And then the ligament itself, because of the injury and the blood can heal, but you have to get these patients early within three weeks or else it doesn't work. If you're past the three, four weeks window, there's gonna be very minimal biology to heal. And the problem is if it doesn't heal, the buttons can you know, break the coracoid base or something bad can happen. So I'm not a big fa fan of these uh, AC ligament repair. For me, my practice, the majority of what I do is reconstruction because I like, because I think non-office you know, treatments uh, would do pretty well for most of the patients I've seen in my practice. The other techniques uh, I, you, know, you can do is all arthroscopic approach for this. Uh, this is a technique that I came up with that I published and uh, you can do this everything through a scope as well instead of opening. So same graft, semitendinosis. This is the same patient here. And you can do this uh, with a dissection of the clavicle and a scope in the front. And this is a video that I actually narrated. So I'm just gonna run it for about four, I think it's 3.5 minutes, four minutes, something like that. So you guys can hear it and look at it. You can see a difference the between the two techniques. Yeah, really type five AC separation. You can see the high right this clavicle you won't be able to make sure you can reduce this clavicle if the OR. Here's a portal. B is for viewing. A is accessory portal one. B is accessory portal two. And M is a medial portal. The graph is which stitch with number two sutures a back table to reinforce reconstruction. Viewing posteriorly with a 30 degree arch scope. Spinal needle used to identify the anterior portal. Using the R of one, here we clean out the edge of the coracoid. You want to especially pay attention to go all the way to the medial aspects so and do the entire coracoid for this procedure. So that's with a scope, and that's the bottom that's of the coracoid. I just dissected out. Portal. The R1 is inserted to the accessory A portal. And furthermore, we clean up the superior aspect 
at the base of the core quake, as you can see here. Using the M portal, which is a medial portal, the RF1 is inserted here. The medial aspect, the pipe binder is released off the base of the coracoid. And you want to be able to see the tip of the RF1. Next, a 90 degree suture passer is inserted into the M portal, the medial portal. This passer is able to go around the medial aspect of the coracoid. You want to be able to deploy the suture passer, which is a loop passer. Here, using accessory A portal, a ring grasper is used to bring that loop passer across. And then number two, suture shuttle across from the A portal to the M portal at this point. Next, switching the 30 degree scope with a 70 degree scope, even superiorly. Spinal needle is uh, used anterior and posterior from the distal cloud to identify the anterior and posterior margin for safe debridement of undersurface of the clavicle with the RF1 through the accessory portal B or accessory portal 2. The entire distal clavicle soft tissue is cleaned up with the RF1 all the way past the medial drill tunnel. A small incision is made on uh, the superior aspect of the distal clavicle. Visualization with 70 degree scope. Two drill pits are drilled across, first through the lateral hole and then through the medial hole. You want to make sure you protect this with a, a curette or some sort of suture uh, grasper. And next, the uh, RF1 is inserted to the distal drill hole to clean out the residual soft tissue. You can see this is my glove finger. Subsequently, the same step is repeated on the medial hole. The RF1 is inserted, is clean, used to clean out the soft tissue around the drill tunnel. Using the superior drill hole on the medial side, a 90 degree suture passer is inserted into the tunnel. A loop grasper is used through accessory portal A to grab the suture passer, and then the residual limb of the number two sutures pass across the medial drill tunnel with the distal clavicle. As you can see here, the suture going up around the lateral side of the base, coracoid to the medial drill tunnel. Same step is repeated using the lateral drill tunnel, a 90 degree suture passer is inserted here. The medial suture limb for the number two sutures is passed across the accessory portal A, as well as this passer. And using that uh, shuttling technique, we're able to shuttle the medial aspect of the suture into the lateral drill hole of the distal clavicle, which you can see here. The graph is subsequently passed across and I typically likes to use mineral oil to further facilitate the passage of the allograft. With the distal clavicle introduced position, the two limbs are tearing pieces with the bottom composite screws and a reinforced repair by suturing two limbs upon each other with number two sutures. Thank you. So that's, uh, that's just another way of doing it. That's doing it through all our oscopic techniques. You can do it either open or scopic. It really depends on the patient. and. Uh, what they want uh, for me. And the post-op protocol, same thing for both arscopic open, six weeks in a sling. You know, I start PT at six weeks with range of motion, active assisted active, strengthening about two, two and a half, three months and return to sports about six months or so uh, before you can get back to sports. You know, some of the pearls is easier to do with this arscopic for type five versus type three because you need a dissect out underneath. If it's not displaced enough, it's very hard to get your one underneath to dissect this out. And then uh, you want to draw five or 5.5 millimeter tunnels. Uh, you want to use a tape to reinforce tie on top. You could do a little bit of discal clavicle excision depending if they have some arthritic changes before. And then if you can't do this arscopically, you can always bail out by opening the patient's shoulder and do it in open. So this is a patient that was sent to me. Uh, he failed a open CC reconstruction. You do not want to do this with arscopic technique. This is the one you want to open up. You can see massive atrial formation, heterotopic bone, this is way displaced. He already had one surgery already at an outside hospital. And this is a pretty difficult operation. You can see this is a normal side. This is a type, uh, you know, five, seven, whatever you want to call it. It's pretty significantly displaced. It's almost 300% the contra size. So this guy, you get a big, you know, big deformity, big decision. So you go down. I do the same technique. And here's his original graft that was done from another surgeon. You take that out. Uh, and then put a couple retractors. You take the osteotone, resect some of the bone. 
and then uh, I put a couple of graphs. I took a semi T. I took his uh, auto autograph and also reinforced it with our allograph because it's a revision surgery. So here's the uh, construct and then closure. And you can see I brought it down pretty significantly. And, and the guy had a pretty big resection by the outside surgeon. So there's nothing I can do there. You know, typically I wouldn't resect that much. I would just do a little bit. Uh, that's quite a bit. So in terms of return to spores, this is a nice little paper out uh, in the article, and they found that about 84% uh, will go to the same level of pre-injury spores after CC reconstruction. And that's why I tell my patients, you have a pretty good chance after surgery to go back to your spores um, or heavy you know, labor activity. So in summary, types three AC separations, I think for, for me in my practice, non offer most patients three to six months of PT, you know, may progress to AC arthritis in the future. You can deal with it later. Uh, surgery, you know, I talk to patients that are overhead after heavy labors and, and uh, to do surgery early or acutely is a sure decision between me and the patient. Type five AC separations, relative indication of surgery, uh, low demand patients, I always say non-op, and then high demand or athletes is a discussion uh, with me in my practice and is a sure decision on whether they want surgery or not acutely. So arthroscopic CC repair, that's the one you have to do with a button. I typically don't do that because I'm afraid that the biology is not there and they don't heal and something could happen. So for me, I typically like to do uh, reconstruction. And if I do the reconstruction is anatomic, you want to make sure you re recreate the tri uh, coronoid and the trapezoid ligament. You can do this arthroscopic open. Uh, I use allograph for most patients. If I do a revision, it's an autograph option. And then I always re reinforce with some sort of tape to tie on top. So while the biology heals, something can hold it down for you. Uh, you want to drill two tunnels anatomically. Post-op rehab, six weeks in a sling, return spores six to nine months. I think more than 80% will return if you do the surgery right. So thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Dr. Lee, for that talk on the management of AC separation. Does anyone have any questions for Dr. Lee or any comments? It's good. <laughs> I know one question I had was uh, for the types that are uh, more leaning to non-op, um, for the patients or the high elite athletes or uh, workers that might have more overhead movement like construction workers, have there been any studies or from your own practice, have you seen um, the patient satisfaction differ between those who uh, choose non-op versus those who choose to to have surgery? I think it's pretty similar, you know, tell you the truth. I think, I mean, I tell you a good story. So um, Dan Marino, I think uh, the guy that won the Super Bowl multiple times, he had a type five AC separation, I was non-op. And he, he was, he's a quarterback. And uh, that that's on his, uh, you know, on his throwing arm, I believe. That's what, at least what I heard. And, you know, one of my friends who covered a uh, professional football team and says that if you go to a locker room and a professional football team, a lot of these guys will have clavicle stick way up, you know, in the football teams. They don't get it operated on, and they do fine. So I think, I think uh, for the type five, the ones that, you know, that doesn't do as well is when you have that dissociation between the clavicle and the scapula. So if you look at somebody's shoulder, if they have an AC separation and one side of the shoulder just droops down significantly and the other side is normal, when that shoulder droops down significantly and there's a dissociation between the scapula and, and the clavicle because the AC joints separated, those are the patients that in my mind, or I, what I typically see don't do as well. Uh, in the patients that have a separation, the scapula is still pretty kinematically similar to the other side and they have good range of motion and strength. And the only thing they complain about is that deformity on top, um, they, that's fine. You know, I tell them I'm not gonna do surgery for the deformity. There's too much risk in that surgery for me to do uh, just to fix it down so that you don't have a bump. Uh, you know, I do this for a bump. That's why I tell a patient. I, you know, I, talk, I spend more time talking patients out of surgery than I do into surgery. And a lot of people are very happy when I say, oh yeah, thank, you know, that's great. I, I, I'm glad I listened to you that I didn't do surgery for this because I, know, I feel fine now, four months later, six months later. You know. Thank you. Does anyone else have any uh, questions or comments for Dr. Lee? Um, I have a question. Thank you so much for that informative um, lecture. So now that you've seen all these different types of injuries, have you been part of any sort of like feedback for safety guidelines for sports or any sort of like safety um, gear? 
well, any I, types of injuries? This one is probably, you know, direct injury to the shoulder. Um, in football, a lot of people have shoulder pads that can help him uh, prevent injury. The problem with the other sports like soccer and, and uh, lacrosse is I don't think you're allowed to wear any kind of shoulder gear to, to play. Um, I don't even think you could do it to prevent them. You know, like if you're a soccer player, you fall, you land directly on your shoulder. Uh, you have enough force, you're going to have these injuries, I think. Thank you. Any further questions, comments? Dr. Lopez? Uh, well, let me say thanks so much, Tiger, as usual. Your uh, talk show was very enlightening and engaging. I uh, never stop. Everyone's um, on the edge of their seat watching, uh, especially your use of uh, the tech. I love it, Tiger.